Hello, so uh, there has been unusual interest in, in the West about the political crisis engulfing Tunisia this week. Uh, naturally, Tunisia has always been the seen the cradle of the Jasmine Revolution and the nation that showed uh, the best prospect for democratization in the MENA region. But this week, the president froze the parliament for one month and dismissed the prime minister, moves that were greeted, I might say, with great jubilation by a large swath of the Tunisian population. Uh, but also, uh, it, it's been seen by many, including some foreign observers, as steps towards killing the prospect of democracy in, in that country. This is Areski Daoud of Mayor Risk LLC, and today is the 27th of July, 2021. So what is happening today in Tunisia should be no surprise. The current political structure that emerged in the post-2011 Jasmine Revolution has been clearly poorly conceived in my humble opinion, or at least it is uh, still work in progress. Hyperpartisan politics remained perhaps one of the biggest obstacles to getting Tunisia out of its malaise. Uh, the country's leaders are torn between modernization and liberal policies on, on the one hand versus the conservatism and traditionalist ideologies on the other. In particular terms and on the ground, the heart of the political crisis in Tunisia is the failure of Tunisian lawmakers to come up with mechanism that would clearly define the role of the various political stakeholders and players. Now in the United States, for example, we know that despite extreme tense partisan politics and clearly deep divisions, the separation of roles between the executive, legislative and judicial branches is absolutely clear and even sacrosanct. We experience the level of independence of these three branches all the time. Well, in Tunisia, the people who framed the constitution did not go the extra mile, if I can use that term, and may have ne neglected to address many critical shortcomings that are at the heart of the Tunisian political crisis. Not only the executive branch has extremely tense relations with the legislative branch, headed by the Islamist of a Nahda party, but even within the executive branch we see crippling disagreements and indeed in fighting between the president and the prime ministers that he has appointed over time. Now this unfinished business in the legal framework, defining relations between the various governing branches and elites, identifying and also limiting prerogatives is a central reason behind the problem facing Tunisia including how to tackle the COVID pandemic, radicalization, riots, economic turmoil, and other issues. This level of instability explains why since 2011, the country has had three presidents, four national assemblies, and eight prime ministers. The country's top leaders have focused their communications and public relations uh, outreach on a, uh, based on a, a populist narrative essentially blaming the others for the ill of the country while clearly neglecting uh, effective negotiations to reach consensus. There are currently roughly three protagonists in the political scene in Tunisia, each of which is pushing and pulling the various levels of levers of politics in ways that are clearly counterproductive and which seeks advantages for themselves and for their followers. Well, there obviously the, there's obviously the head of state, that is the current president, the pr is also the prime minister, and then the president of the legislature. Behind them, of course, uh, are a series of political parties, labor unions, civic organizations, and others that are obviously also extremely divided. Appointed by President Qais Saeed in August 2020 to succeed Elias Fakhfakh, who resigned as prime minister, the current Prime Minister, Hisham Mashishi, leaned on a number of political parties in Parliament, principally the Islamist and Nahda party, but also Qalb Tunis and Al Karama coalition, uh, to form what became afterwards a government, or a, government, a cabinet government. The problem is that this parliamentary trio, if, if you will, has been at odds with the head of state, that is President Qais, as I explained in 
my previous statement. And obviously the president gets upset and feels sidelined when decisions are made. Uh, to illustrate the volatility and the volatile nature of governance in Tunisia, a few weeks after forming a government, the new prime minister, Mashishi, dismissed the minister of culture, Walid Zidi, who was opposed to the suspension of cultural event and who stood against many COVID-19 confinement measures. The prime minister then dismissed the minister of interior, Tawfiq Sharfuddin, who is very close to President Qais Said. He dismissed him for having made staffing decisions at the Minister of the Interior's Paris unit, dismissing officials close to a Nahda party. Prime Minister Mishishi obviously felt rather sidelined in this decision, hence the firing of the minister. Now, in the meantime, the coalition of parties that I mentioned earlier, namely Al Nahda, Qalb Tunis, and Al Karama, broadly speaking, these are parties of uh, belonging to the general conservative movement. They've also had, uh, you know, the ambition of firing cabinet ministers who were considered too close to the president. The coalition targeted 11 ministers to be replaced by officials of their choosing. As you would guess, the president blocked the reshuffle and refused to administer the taking of oath at the presidential palace. Now, while these political crises amplified distrust and magnified confrontation between the key decision makers in, in Tunisian government, the prime minister and his cabinet have had to the obligation to deal with what I call the day-to-day -day management of the country. And in, and in doing so, they have essentially exacerbated the various crises affecting the country, chief of which has been the management of the pandemic, using quite often repression to quell social unrest and tapping into more high interest loans to fill the, the budget deficit without any debate, without any due process. So now what you see in the news media about what's going on in Tunisia is inevitable. It's inevitable that the crisis eventually peaks at some point and what I would say that the bubble burst. But clearly there is a great deal of uncertainty as to where Tunisia is headed today. Many see the first measures taken by President Qais Saeed as a, a sign of a coup. As you know, the Tunisian president decided on Sunday, this past Sunday, the 25th of July, uh, to freeze the work of the parliament for 30 days and to grant himself more executive power after a day of street protests targeting in particular the prime minister who he sacked and his backer, the main party in power, the Islamist leaning Nada. The latter obviously called the president's move a coup and called for um, new presidential and legislative elections. But since then, President Qais Said has, as I said, dismissed his, prime, his, his Minister of Defense and took over that function before appointing a head of the Presidential Guard, which some analyst, legal analyst, say is contrary to the Constitution and shows his desire to rely on the army to strengthen his power. A decree signed on the 22nd of July, that is yesterday, forbids anyone who has served as a minister, any member of parliament, any really senior level uh, folks from leaving the country. Well, the same decree freezes all administrative, economic and financial activities except those relating to defense, to security and naturally to public, uh, public health. A communique from the presidency announced the establishment of a curfew prohibiting travel throughout the national territory from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. and that from effective from July the 22nd, 26th, pardon me, to August 27th, 2021. Any movement in this time slot is strictly prohibited with the exception of health emergencies. <clears throat> the curfew period can be adjusted according to security needs. Gathering of more than three people and other activities are strictly prohibited on roads or public places. Now, these decisions are considered by many as a power grab, but at the end of the day, 
they were they are also somewhat in line with the restrictions previously imposed by the authorities to deal with the current deadly wave of the coronavirus that Tunisia is experiencing. But breaking the cycle of infighting in government was inevitable. What happens next is the billion dollar question. Finally, if your organization is operating in the regions where we operate, or you're traveling there, including Tunisia, we have a critical incident awareness and notification system that leverages mobile and GPS technology to keep you aware of what's going on around you and around your employees. Get in touch with us to sign up or just visit us at shield-alert.com. That'd be shield-alert.com. Until our next talk, thank you and goodbye.